Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com, late night study, and I'm going to need Dr. Pepper for this one. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and before you through him only and in the Holy Spirit grateful for the access that we have to come before you thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to continue on here even though we look forward to your coming redeeming the time I just ask that you would filter out all error and foolishness all ignorance but just seal to our hearts only that which is truth for it's in Christ's name I pray it's in Christ's name I ask Amen we've uh if you've been following along in these videos and uh, romans you know that we're in romans chapter six we've just began romans chapter six and we're camped out here for a while it's not something that we need to rush through that we want to rush through this is a very dynamic passage of scripture uh, in the epistle to the Romans not that any passage is any more important than another but I've titled this Christ is not a mortician he's not someone who dresses up the uh, the old man the the corpse of the flesh puts makeup on the flesh I hope that that's a good title that that pushes this narrative along and creates a sense of I guess importance as to the text that we're dealing with right here so our text is, is Romans chapter 6 verses 1 through 11 I want to put this up on the screen uh, so that we can look at it but it's going to be a little different than what you might be used to because I'm going to to put on the screen what I've worked through in the original text and we're gonna as I've said in previous videos we're gonna look a little closer at just what's going on here with the grammar and the meaning of the words and so on and so forth so I'm not in any hurry to get through this uh, it's not something that we just want to blow past uh, it is it's very there's a simplicity in its complexity and so if you'll just bear with me here what I'm going to do is I'm going to to put up on the screen the uh, my working graph if you want to call it that uh, chart graph uh, it's uh, somewhat color-coded it's got notes on it I've always focused on the King James Version because uh, and, and often which I often refer to as the authorized version because that's the, the version that I'm most familiar with and it's the version that I believe most of our viewers are from familiar with as well so this is and I can't emphasize this enough this is a very dynamic passage of scripture we've gone if you followed us along in this teaching we've come through five chapters to get to here to chapter 6 and what we are about to look at here in chapter 6 really would would not make any sense well it, it make little sense whatsoever if it if it were not for the first five chapters and everything that that we've looked at all the glorious truth that we've looked at in the last five chapters what we are looking at here would not have anything to rest upon so I'm going to present the indisputable facts these are just facts which then forces us to draw a conclusion based upon those facts and I believe this is the way that we can we can be assure ourselves that we're dealing honestly with the text so taking a closer look now at our present text 
what you're looking at here is uh, before I put up the original text we're gonna look at at just what we looked at through uh, the King James what we're seeing through the King James the first thing that I want you to notice on the the top left corner of the screen is that it does say King James Bible so we're basically all uh, looking at the same thing most of us are the second thing that I want you to look at is the, the subtitle for this passage that the translators uh, de decided that they would give this and that is dead to sin and alive to God now that should really sp speak volumes in my opinion as to what we are the subject in which we are looking at it's it's almost uh, you can look at it in the in the sense that the, the translators uh, use this that title to sort of sum up everything that's that we're looking at I believe that's I don't believe that's a bad summary now starting with verse 1 what shall we say then shall we continue in sin the grace may abound anytime we see that the word sin singular it almost always refers to the sin nature the old man the Adamic nature the nature that we inherited in Adam the flesh the old creation that are the old man in however you want to in whatever way you want to refer to it all of the garbage in your life shall we continue in that that grace may abound God forbid how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein notice it does not say what it doesn't say and we can learn as much by what the text doesn't say as what it says how shall we that are dead to sin so it's not that we need to die to sin, that we should die to sin, that we must die to sin, we have to die to sin. Oh, God help us if we don't die to sin. We are, the text says, and I said I was going to present the facts here. The text says that we are dead to sin. Now, last I checked, death is uh, quite a, well, uh, what is the word? Uh, quite a it's quite a uh, important subject I mean it's death is death it's it's a uh, uh, we can't just look at this as something figurative even though uh, our crucifixion with Christ is not something that we actually have an experience of um, that we actually can say that well I remember yeah I remember being crucified with Christ God is not speaking in uh, he is speaking in a, in a figurative sense but the reality of it is, is that the old man truly was that which he took down into death with him this happened it it actually happened it it it, it literally occurred we were crucified with Christ, but more than that, buried, raised, even ascended and co-seated with Christ in the heavenlies. God has a purpose for telling us this. He's not trying to be poetic. He's not trying to be uh, anything other than factual. We are dead to sin. And how can we live in that any longer? Well, I want you to try to think of someone who has passed away who you could almost just as easily say that someone who has passed away who's lying six feet under how can they live in the world any longer well the truth is they can't how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein the word live is, is zoe it represents the quality of life how can there be any quality of life in something in which we no longer exist and no no ye not here's the first the word no is uh, is important because what we're gonna see we're gonna see that mentioned uh, at least twice 
twice, I believe, or three times, three times, three times the word no is used. It's now when we see something with such emphasis as that, we, we can we can pretty much be assured that God is really wanting us to know something. Know ye not that so many of us, now this is speaking of God's sheep, God's elect, not the non-believers. Know ye not that so many of us as were identified into Jesus Christ, baptized, the word baptized is identified with, into Jesus Christ, were identified into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, in the same way, we also should walk in newness of life. Now we see the purpose in all of this. It's a different walk. Rather than a walk in the flesh, it's a walk in the Spirit. Our ongoing walk in Christ is one that is on the resurrection side of the cross, not the the death side of the cross. For if we, and that if is a first class condition in the Greek, and for those of you who are still confused as to what a first class condition in the grammar is, we can translate it since because it's followed by an indicative. For since we have been planted. Have we been planted? Yes, we have. For since we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, now we have the word know again, that our old man, all of that garbage, all of that crap that you see in your life that you, you don't like because you've been born of God. Uh, contrast that with the non-believer who really practices to get better at his sin. There's no conflict. In fact, he takes pleasure in unrighteousness. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be annulled. The word is annulled, not destroyed, not, not in the sense of eradicated or eliminated. We know that from 1 John. He, if we say we have no sin, the truth is not in us might be made of no effect that henceforth we should not serve sin or be it's it's uh, under the slavery of sin it shouldn't have dominion over our lives not so the truth is is that god left us with the old man that's un an unquestionable fact he didn't remove or eradicate the sin nature he could have but he chose not to and we do continue to sin, but as we, and I pointed this out in the past, that, that we're being cleansed of all sin as we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, so therefore we're sinning as we walk in the light. Knowing that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might destroy, that henceforth we should not serve sin. He, for he that is dead, is freed from sin sin freedom I, I i i'm really taken back by that one verse verse seven because it's what all christians long for it's, it's what all christians true sincere christians ache for is to be free from sin not free from the existence of the old man, but the domineering nature of that old man, the slavery of the old man, that it would control our lives. Don't get confused here. The old man, he did not, God did not eradicate the old man. When he put it to death, he made it ineffective, inoperable. That's, he annulled it, okay? We still sin, but it doesn't have to be the dominating factor, controlling factor in our life. We don't have to be slaves to it. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe. Here's the first time we, we, we see the word believe. That's the word is pistuo, faith. 
that we shall also live with him. That's a, that's a future. It's not a present. I would I would have loved it if it had been in the present tense. It would it would indicate the quality of life that we now experience. But I, I'm like I said, I'm dealing with facts here. If we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall in the future also live with him. Knowing, here's the word, knowing again, God really wants us to know this, that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. It's just a one-time thing. Death hath no more dominion over him. And in that same way, for in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. And now we come to Romans 6, 11. Likewise, reckon, and the word is legizomai. It means it's a bookkeeping term. It means count it as true. Don't call God a liar. Agree with God. It's not faith. Take note of the fact that he did not say, likewise, believe ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Now that is highly important. Why is that important? It's important because it wouldn't make any sense if he had used the word belief or faith. And I hope to explain that as I go along here. Reckoning is not of faith. In fact, it's because, because whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Therefore, we need reckoning because we need to, we need to be able to, to be involved in an ongoing activity that is apart from faith. I'm not reducing or or I'm not trying to suggest that faith is any less important. Reckoning and faith go hand in hand. They're both vitally important. We know that our faith is as precious as gold, but we're also to be involved in, in a daily ongoing activity of counting it a fact because that, that reckoning is, it is a present active indicative. In other words, it is an ongoing activity, a vital ongoing activity in the life of the believer. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's two parts to that. Romans 6.11a, Romans 6.11b. The A is, is dead. The B is alive. We can't stop halfway. We have to, if we're involved in true reckoning, we're reckoning both. Dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We do that because reckoning, and I, I wish that I could, I was better at explaining this, but as I said, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So we don't, we all have a measure of faith the this the old man continues to sin and we are to count it as a fact that we're dead to sin but alive unto god through jesus christ our lord let not we look at verse 12 let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof Neither yield ye your members of instruments of un, uh, unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God. So we, we've got a we've got the contrast between unrighteousness and righteousness coming up here, as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have; it shall not have. We could stop right there and, and ponder over those words and come to the conclusion that there really is a position or a condition or a, an, a, a sphere in, of, of life within the believer's life in which he can come to, to where that sin shall not have dominion over us. It is not, we can never say that, that we'll never uh, ever be able to come to a, a point of not, uh, of, we'll never, we'll always be stuck in this rut of never uh, sin always having dominion over us. We can come to a, the point in which sin does not have dominion over us even though we still sin. And that is through reckoning ourselves dead to sin but alive unto God 
in Christ Jesus. And the purpose is given, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. That's, I, I, I'm speechless. I just don't have the words to, to, to explain this any better than this, except that, that these are God's words, folks, and man could not have possibly written this. The number of personal pronouns that I counted referring to us, maybe off by one or two, is 25. But I want you to note the order. If you go back to the top, note, no law or fleshly activity is involved here. Rather, if you look at the action verbs, if you look at them, what we're involved in is knowing, believing, reckoning, walking, and yielding. Nothing about, I want you to stop smoking, I want you to stop playing cards, I want you to stop, you know, listening to this kind of music, I want you to stop doing this, stop doing this, start doing this, and do this, and do this, and do this. For we are not under the law, but under grace. In the whole entire passage, note the order, knowledge, faith, agreement with God, not calling him a liar, a certain way that we walk in submission to God, yielding, okay? Now, on the right side, where it says action, verbs, us, if you look at all the red, those are all what I marked out as the negatives, say, continue, live, serve, let, obey. We don't continue to speak and live wrongly. We don't serve wrongly. And we don't, we're not involved in allowing and being under the hearing of that which is wrong. The reason I said under the hearing of is that that's the word for obey. Many of you are probably used to, to the word obey. When, when you hear the word or you read the word obey, you believe that you're looking at a word that is synonymous with the word do, and that is simply not true. There's, there's a word in the Greek for do, and that is poieo, and there's a word for obey, which is an entirely different word, which is hupakuo. The word here in the Greek is akuo. The intense form of here is hupakuo, and that's the word for obey. So we're not to... The, we don't allow, and uh, we're not to allow or to be under the hearing of that which is wrong. So in this, we see the King James Version, that, that gives it credibility, the, the, the passage title, Dead to Sin, Alive unto God, the sin, singular, which we know refers to the old man, the, the fact that we are dead, not that we should die, but that we are Non-legal activity, none. There's no legal activity involved in the, in the activity or the responses, uh, the don'ts, the, the negatives. We see the results of, of these negatives. We see what happens if we don't come, come under the hearing of God concerning this passage. We see the relationship that it has to freedom. We see that that how it's describing what it re really means to be yielded unto God. We, we see the positives and their results. We see the purpose, the number of personal pronouns, the certainty of life, quality of life, zoe in the Greek, in the future. There's so, there we see security because of our identification with Christ. And we see the order of the injunctions presented. That knowing, believing, reckoning, walking, and yielding is amazing. That's that's what I saw in this. I know that if you looked at it, you'd, you'd, you'd have to see the same thing. Folks, there's just no life in the sin nature. There's no life there. And yet, that's where most Christians focus their attention. That's where most Christians live. It defines legalism, and Jesus presently lives in, in the heart of every believer. He's ever anxious to accomplish through you what you yourself will never be able to do. God knew this when he wrote this. 
this righteousness, which comes from the spirit of life himself, it, it is always in opposition with the dead works of your self-life, the flesh life. You're, the text is teaching us that your self-life must be recognized as inactive, inoperable, ineffective, crucified with him so that your body of sin might be made ineffective, annulled, thus leaving you no longer a slave to that, a slave to sin. Because our attempts, our accomplishments, our frustrations, all, all of our failures were all buried with him through baptism into his death that was accomplished nearly 2,000 years ago so that we may walk in newness of life, his life, the resurrection side of the cross, just like he, he, he was raised. Christ is not a mortician. Neither is the believer in Christ to be. We don't put makeup on a, on a dead corpse. We establish the law through the spirit of life in Christ, not by our own efforts. That is the, that is the spirit of death in self. This is actually being accomplished in the lives of believers who truly recognize what the Apostle Paul meant when he wrote, It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Galatians 2.20 If we are to be of those who bear fruit for God, then it must be his life and not our own. How marvelous it is. So simple. For it is by faith that we trust in him and not ourselves. Just trying to be the best Christian possible is not good enough. It never will be good enough. If you are doing your best to please God, then you are living according to the flesh. And if you are living... According to the flesh, you must die. Death always comes before life, folks. It always does. As Christ gave his life for us, we must give ours for his. I don't mean give him our physical life, but rather the independent exercise of our own volition and, and our own capabilities. Wasn't this exactly what Christ did? When he came in the incarnation, it's beautiful. The Father worked through him. So in order for us to bear fruit unto God, we must consider, reckon daily ourselves to be dead to sin and alive to Christ. Our righteousness, our very best, can never outdo, outperform his righteousness. And should we even attempt to do so, we would separate ourselves from our true source of righteousness, Christ, who is our life. This is what the passage, folks, is, is teaching. This is where we come to in our study through Romans here. It all rests, too, on the, the previous five chapters. Our our identification with him in his death, burial, and res resurrection nullifies self and gains life. His life. His life. Each one of our lives were freely relinquished to our Lord Jesus Christ the day that his life was given to us. All of our future belongs to him and his purposes. And since this is true, our responsibility to constantly seek his direction is tremendous. Dearly beloved, we were brought into eternal life through a very special process. We came into contact with the Word of God. God the Holy Spirit illumined, opened our eyes, mind, understanding, uh, to his word, of his word to us, concerning 
the person and the work of Jesus Christ, which is, of course, the gospel. Because we were first made alive in Christ, faith, faith was then given to us by God to believe the truth of that gospel. We could not have believed in any other way, thereby allowing us to fully trust Christ in his finished work. When we responded to him through that faith, the full work of Jesus Christ was realized in our lives. We were indwelt, not just by Christ, we were indwelt by the fullness of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Born again of imperishable seed, Jesus Christ himself in the new nature. This new nature was created sinless and devoid of the, of the, of the ability, the, the capability of ever sinning. This is actually true because his seed, Jesus Christ, abides in us. And that new nature responds only to God. And it fully, that new nature fully trusts the finished work of Jesus Christ. It loves the law of God. And it rejoices when Jesus fulfills any requirement of the law in and through our lives, in and through the believer's life. The only blockade for that new nature to express the life of Christ in the believer's life is the active manifestation of the old nature, the self. Folks, these truths will stir in you to change from the living death that you're now experiencing to the fresh and living life of Christ himself who lives within. I believe the way we know we are living in the, in the old man or the new really is a discernment that can't be determined on the basis of sight, walking by sight, looking at ourselves, but faith and reckoning. The old man can do nothing but sin. It always sins. It always will. We see that old man and thereby, you know, we, que we question how we can be living in the new man because we know we can't, we can't live in both. There's just no life in the old. There is in the new. I believe Romans 6.11 is a key passage regarding this doubt. If we are continually reckoning as we are commanded to do, ourselves dead to sin but alive unto God in Christ, if this is an ongoing activity, present active indicative, as it should be, not an aorist, one-time thing, we can be assured that we are indeed living in the new, walking in the spirit, not the flesh, our affections set upon things above, not on things below, because we have died and our life is hidden with Christ in God. In short, the problem there is, is, a, is allowing the activities of the old man to dictate or determine where we are at in our experience. We can't do that. It all boils down to how we are living as new creations. In, in what sphere of existence are we living? In the flesh, law, or grace, the spirit. The spirit or the flesh. And God has nothing to do with the flesh. He's not a mortician. He's not dressing up the old man. He's not putting makeup on the old man. The grammar confirms it to be a vital ongoing activity, present active indicative reckon. If it were a one-time action, something we just did once, it'd be an aorist tense in the grammar. It's not. We reckon daily two sides to Romans 6, 11, death and life, dead to sin, but alive unto God, not continuing, well, leaves us floundering in a sea of doubt, despair, 
feelings of hopelessness. We cannot argue with the grammar. Furthermore, reckoning is not faith, which explains the constant need. It is a present active indicative. It's not an aorist tense. It's the first command we're given in Romans. We reckon on both sides of the colon, both sides of Romans 6.11, and we do that daily. The present tense is so that our old is held inoperable, not a slave. Ongoing daily activity of true reckoning provides comfort, joy, peace, rest, freedom, and the, the freedom to serve and the ability for the new to express itself despite the ongoing failure of the flesh, which God has nothing to do with. Many are fretting over that, which God himself is not. Why would you continue to focus on things below, not above, to live in that in which you died? When reckoning is simply our agreeing with God, is God's provision here we're looking at, folks, apart from faith. Counting it as a fact. That's simply counting it as true. Dead to sin, alive unto God. God did not use the word faith here, but reckon, legizomai, not pastuo, not faith. And for good reason. If you think through that, you'll understand that. And these are not the words of Paul, but of God. It's not, we're not looking at Paul's reasoning or logic. It's not the world religious system's reasoning or logic. Certainly isn't that. But it is God's word. God asks us to believe him, to trust him, that we trust in him and not ourselves. In fact, it is what God desires of us the most. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Folks, where are your affections? Where are they set? Are they set on things below or above? Gracious Heavenly Father, I come into your presence once more, just thankful for the opportunity you've given us just to think about your word. I know there are a lot of hurting souls out there that are looking to find peace and joy and rest and comfort and strength and encouragement in their walk with you. I know they love you, Lord. But they just haven't come yet to understand that there's nothing good in the flesh, that you have nothing to do with it, but that they can know and understand the, the freedom of release through death to go on and continue serving you with great joy and with great comfort. I thank you for all of our viewers, Lord Jesus. I pray that you would meet all of their needs. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Look, I love you all. I truly do. This is Steve. Thank you for watching.